Revenge of the Black Cloak Society, a King's Quest based fic. Chapter 15 The Nature of the Cat. Saladin stood at the base of the mountain, looking up the winding path that led to the peak. Inwardly, he had reservations about the plan that Al King Alexander had thought up, but he could not think up a better one, and time was running short. He glanced down at his near feline companion again, curbing the base instincts of his kind. He had to remember that the feline was not just a simple cat. He had no trouble dealing with that when he met the occasional cata, but he figured that was because the creatures were more humanoid in appearance. His feline companion looked up at him, and Saladin had to give him credit. There were none of the signs a simple feline makes when confronted by a bigger opponent. The cat, however, did say, we will have to be very careful going up the mountain, but the path gets very narrow at points. Saladin nodded, and they both started up the path. Right away he realized it would take some time to make it to the top. The path started out wide, but quickly narrowed. It had twists and turns in it, and at some of those Saladin had to fight to keep his balance. He noticed that his companion up the mountain didn't seem to struggle with that. Maybe the spell had some benefits to it in this situation since felines are known for their grace. As they reached the halfway point, Saladin paused to look around. He had both the feeling that they were being watched and that an attack was coming. If an attack was coming, he was certain that they would be easily defeated on such a narrow path. After a moment, he continued, saying, This path would be an easy place to defend. One cannot easily dodge attacks. He saw his companion nod. He then realized why no attacks came. If the wizard would have attacked them, it might destroy the only link the wizard had with Ludor. Added to that was the fact that the path was so long. It gave whomever was at the beginning or end of the path a chance to prepare. No wonder Mananan seemed to be so confident in his powers. As they reached the top, Saladin felt more on edge. The thought that this wizard was waiting for them didn't set well with him. Knowing how evil worked, he was certain that Mananan would strike down the king before they did anything. Still, he also knew how villains loved to gloat over their defeated foes. It was one of their biggest shortcomings. In fact, it was that shortcoming that King Alexander's plan was revolving around. When they reached the door to the house, he noticed the door had been left unlocked. His companion, in an almost complete feline form, just pushed on the door, allowing them to easily enter the place. It was another thing to put Saladin on his, the highest of alert. He was certain that even though they now knew what the plan of the villain was, it was not a guarantee that the wizard would not kill any of them. Once in the building, he watched as his companion crossed the room. He remembered from the briefing that the room across from the front door was the wizard's study. He followed the feline form through the door, and in the corner of the room he saw Mananan. While the fiend looked old, he held himself with the appearance of strength and pride. If it weren't for the fact that this was a member of the Black Cloak Society, he would respect the evil wizard. Any chance of that ended, however, when the wizard raised his wand, pointing it at the feline with Saladin. Alexander, or should I refer to you as Gwydion, as I used to, before you die. He wondered now, for the first time, if the king's plan would work.
Celeste quickly flew up the northern side of the mountain. In her arms she held a near feline form. It was part of King Alexander's plan. As she flew, however, she enjoyed the winds that seemed to act as an obstacle to anyone daring to climb up the northern face of the mountain. To any not used to the winds of the sacred mountain, or even flying in general, they were a death sentence. Despite that, she looked down at her companion and asked, Are you doing all right? I know you aren't accustomed to the, this high wind. The feline form she was holding didn't look at her, but he did respond. I'll be fine. Have the others reached the wizard's house yet? She could hear the concern in the feline's voice, and knew what she had to do. She started focusing on her ears, and the hearing spell the djinn had cast before they split up. Celeste focused on the wizard's house, and instantly she heard everything that was happening. She heard the evil wizard gloating, which meant that the other group had arrived. It is only fitting that Shadrach freed me from the form you tried to curse me to. Do you know how long I had to suffer in that form until he found the spell to undo that insufferable spell? If it wasn't for the fact that I have allowed those cultists to unleash their demon on the world, I would let you suffer for that long as well. Those last words sent a chill through her spine, making her wings shiver and falter. She then drew a breath and said to the feline, They have gotten there, and he's gloating. He even said about how the cultists were summoning a demon. Since the plan involved her heading to, her, to the house at that moment, they heard him gloating. She started to make her way towards the house. As she flew toward the house, she heard the feline take a sharp intake of breath. I heard about those cultists. They are crazy trying to bring that thing into our world. It will destroy all life here. She then heard the feline make a thoughtful sound, as if another thought crossed his mind. Or maybe that claim is just to unnerve us. Mananan would never allow the cult, that cult to get a foothold. He's never been that destructive. As she neared the house, she made a disgusted sound. After seeing the effects the of the Gorgons on Port Bruce, she doubted the evil wizard had that kind of limitations. From what she had heard, certain members of the Black Cloak Society were bent on world destruction. It wasn't impossible to think that the threat they now faced was that deranged. Then Abdul Alhazred had wanted to see the Green Isles in a perpetual civil war, which would destroy the Green Isles. Her anger at that foul person gave her a focus, and she pulled out the weapon she had kept on her. It was a bolo, and she started swinging it. She knew she didn't want to crash through the window, since she wanted to avoid cutting herself or the feline on any glass. She also knew that the window was nowhere near where the others would be standing. With that in mind, she hurled the bolo, and it hit its mark. As it happened, she heard the evil wizard shout out something, and she knew he wouldn't be striking out just yet. She dove into the window, tossing her feline companion over to where Saladin and the other feline was. She then landed right next to Saladin and she saw a shocked look on Manannan's face. It was almost comical, especially as he looked between the two felines. It was obvious that if he had expected them to arrive, he didn't expect two feline forms. Then Celeste noticed the look he was giving her and Saladin. It was one that told her that either the guard dog or herself was about to die. As she saw the wizard prepared to attack, one of the felines leapt into action, aiming for Manannan's face. She took that moment to die for cover, noticing Saladin was doing the same. Manannan had been surprised when he saw two feline forms. It had taken him a moment to realize what was happening. The djinn! Shamir had obviously taken on a feline form to confuse him. 
The hard part was trying to figure out which cat was Alexander and which one was the djinn. He had no qualms about killing the djinn as long as Alexander survived this battle. He had the strangest feeling that the oracle had already tipped this group off about the plan Shadrach had. He just had to make sure that the group wasn't tipped off to Shadrach's identity. That was why he planned to attack the winged one. He had hoped that by attacking the girl he could give Abdul an easier time when his part of the plan began. Unfortunately, just as he raised his wand to cast a spell, one of the felines attacked. The attack took him off guard and disrupted the attack. He tried to shake the attacking feline free, but it held on tight, the claws digging into him. At one point he managed to get a look at the feline's face and saw the eyes. The eyes were the typical yellow of a cat's eyes. If it had been the djinn, as he had remembered from what he had learned in his past, the eyes would be pure gold. He also recalled that this feline had also been the one who had arrived with the winged one girl. He just snarled at the feline and said, A very sneaky plan, Gwydion, but that does not change a thing. He finally shook the feline free, seeing it leap through the air. He didn't see where the feline had landed, but used the momentary confusion that the others were in to send a spell towards the location of the trap door switch. He hit the mark and saw it open up, moving the glass from the window away. That had been a problem since any shard of glass could have turned into a hazard to him. If one of the others grabbed one, they could have hurled it at him or reflected his magic back at him. The only upset upside would be the laceration they would have received. While he was in those thoughts, he also tried to spy Alexander. The now feline king was avoiding his line of sight, and his friends were still holding back. He held up his wand, training it on the group, taunting Alexander as he moved towards the trapdoor. I see you aren't letting them attack, Gwydion. Afraid it will increase the odds of them dying. He started to make his way towards the trapdoor, keeping his wand aimed at them. At that moment, from his left, a feline leapt at him, hissing angrily. He quickly turned his wand to attack the figure, and saw the eyes. The feline was the djinn. His magical attack would not affect the creature the same way as it would Alexander. There was a chance, however, that the djinn might fall down into the lab. If that happened, something down there might wound the creature. Just as the djinn was about to hit him, it disappeared in the golden light. It momentarily blinded him. And in that moment, he felt something hit him from the side. He glanced in the direction and saw a cat-shaped blur leaping away from him. He also noticed that he was losing his balance. He had been so close to the trap door that the brief attack was enough to unbalance him. He was going to fall down into the lab. After all the years of being a cat, he had forgotten that his own cat, a former apprentice, would try to trip him on those steps. As Mananan fell through the trap door, he closed his eyes. He knew he was going to die when he hit the floor. It didn't bother him, since he knew Shadrach's master plan. Once every phase was done, he would be back from the dead. He just wondered to what extent the spell might work. He knew Shadrach knew the effects of the spell, and he would have faith in the leader of the Black Cloak Society. That thought comforted him when he hit the ground and everything went black. Alexander rushed over to the edge of the trapdoor with Shamir at his side. They both watched as Mananan hit the floor. When it happened, he felt something pass through the whole building, and a quick glance at Shamir allowed him to see a momentary change in form. That change had allowed him to see Shamir not in any mortal form, but almost as a being of pure energy. He also felt his form change in that instant. He felt every bit of the feline form he was in shudder, and then revert back to his human form. For a moment he worried, 
not sure if his clothing would return as he returned to his human form or not. He did not want to appear naked in front of Celeste, since she was not his wife. A quick glance down at his body told him all was well. He was human and clothed. He quickly stood up and was thankful to hear both Saladin and Celeste say, Sire, the curse has been lifted. This was accompanied by a hug from Celeste, and inwardly Alexander noted that this was not the same girl he rescued from the Minotaur years ago. She had indeed grown into a kinder, gentler version of herself. It was a change that fit the winged one well. He motioned for the members of his raiding party to step back, and he moved towards the stairs down to the lab. Yes, I'm back to normal, but we need to go down to his lab. There may be a clue to how this is being done down here. He saw the others nod, and he then took the steps down to the Dark Wizard's laboratory. Alexander kept his hand on the right wall as he descended. It wasn't because he had not been used to going down the steps. It was because he knew none of the others would be. And it was always possible that Mananan had set up some sort of trap to survive him after death. He remembered how cruel the wizard had been when he was the wizard's servant boy. Luckily, there had been, not been any traps. And they had all been successful climbing down. The lab was almost how Alexander had remembered it. All over the place there were jars containing several things that were used as ingredients. The fact that all of them were near full told Alexander that someone had made sure Mananan had enough to do spell casting for a while. At that moment he spied a rolled up parchment on the lab table. It didn't look like any sort of spell scroll or anything like that. He walked over to it and noticed something as he neared it. Written on the outside of the scroll was his name. It wasn't the name that Mananan had called him, but his given name. That could only mean that what happened here now had truly been part of someone's master plan. He reached for the scroll, only to have Saladin place a hand out to stop him. He glanced at the guard dog, and his friend just said, Sire, this could be one last trap. It may be best if you don't touch it, at least not until someone can verify it is safe. He couldn't argue that logic. He had heard once that some wizards had a death curse, a spell they would cast in their dying breath. He didn't know how it worked or manifested, but that didn't mean that this scroll wasn't it. He glanced over at Shamir, who was now in his human form, and the djinn just nodded. He watched as the, his other friend walked over to the scroll and held a hand over it. Both the hand and the scroll glowed in a golden light before Shamir lowered his hand. This is odd. I would have thought there was some sort of enchantment on the scroll, but there is none. I can, however, detect that this scroll has been here for a while, which means it isn't a death curse. That information bothered Alexander. If the scroll had been there for days, it meant that whomever left it knew about the big spell that was in the works. Since the scroll seemed devoid of spells, however, he decided it was best to open it. I'm going to check out the scroll. It may give us some information on the big spell that is in the works. Everyone nodded and Alexander unrolled the scroll. He looked over it and noticed that the handwriting on it looked familiar. He quickly realized why that was. He had seen it on a letter written to Abdul al-Hazred years ago. As he read it, he realized how thorough their adversary was. Alexander, I know you will find this note since Mananan is aware of my master plan. You and your family have gotten in the way of my group's plans for far too long. If you don't know already, you are actually a part of my master plan. 
the farther along this spell gets, none of you will be able to stop it without causing massive destruction. I will give you one hint at how you can stop me. Alexander gulped as he read the last words. It was the most devastating thing he could read. And Saladin had put a hand on his shoulder. He heard concern in the canine's voice as he said, What's wrong, sire? Do you know who the scroll is from? He nodded in reply to the question, but his voice was not as soft as possible, mainly due to fear. It's from Shadrach, and he's managed to infiltrate one of the palaces. The words caused two gasps, and Alexander looked around. Celeste had gone missing. He looked upward and said, Where did Celeste go? He felt a little relaxed when Shamir answered, She went up to see how the magic leaves the area, allowing the people to return to normal. He nodded and then decided that maybe she had the right idea. They would need to take the time to see if things had returned to normal in Ludor. Once that was done, they could begin searching for Shadrach. Shadrach had returned to Castle Daventry and made sure he was in his disguise of Kale Silver. He had just been to where the amulet of Lolot was reforming, and it was almost complete. That meant he would be able to enact part four of his master plan at the very moment it would cause the most chaos. Now, however, he had to lay low. He had no doubt that Alexander had read the scroll he had left which meant that everyone would be on their guard. If everything kept going as he planned, he would not be under any suspicion. Still, there was always a chance that he might be underestimating his prey. With that on his mind, he headed to the throne room. He wasn't sure who would be there, since Rosella had been in and out with her wedding plans. Part of him hoped that no one might be in but he figured that wasn't going to happen. When he entered the room, he saw he was right in his thinking. King Graham had returned, and he was talking with Crispin. As he approached, he saw Graham look at him and smile. Ah, Kale, you arrived at a good time. I was just about to tell Crispin about what we found out. First off, and you should mark this down, the royal family is expanding. My son is going to be a father. That news had surprised him. It was something he was going to take into account for when Phase 6 came up. For the time being, he had to smile and act happy. That is very good news. Had I known it was coming, I would have had a scroll ready to write it down. Is that the only thing, then? He knew it wasn't all but he wasn't sure if they suspected him or not. To his relief, Graham nodded and responded, Yes, but it is not good news. I feel it is safe to mention to you, since you arrived after the time we think our threat might have arrived, it seems Shadrach has somehow infiltrated our group, possibly even Alexander's group. We don't know how, but he's been here a while. No doubt he arrived before Derek was struck down. He nodded, keeping quiet as Crispin said, Indeed, it would make sense since it would have taken a lot of power to strike him down from far away. Either way, he would have had to have someone here to spy. It would be the only way he could have known when to strike. Inwardly, Shadrach was laughing at what the old wizard had said. He was being underestimated by one of the most powerful wizards in the world. He figured, however, that he needed to input something at this moment. He looked at King Graham and started to ask, Shall I prepare a list of... 
He trailed off as the door to the room swung open, and Princess Rosella came in, a spring in her step. No doubt the girl had some good news of her own to share, and he hoped that it would work with his plans. Once she reached the mall, she said, Father, I'm glad you are back. I've just heard from Edgar. In a month's time, we will be in Tamir for the wedding. Janesta said she would preside. That was indeed good news. It meant that the chaos caused by his plan would be the maximum it could be. He smiled, and the news almost distracted him from the part of his guise he had just started. He was brought back to it when Graham said, That is very good news. Kale, I will stop by your quarters later to talk about uh, the other thing. Right now, I need to get some things planned out regarding the wedding. He nodded and then left the room. Everything was falling into place for phase four. And once that started, he could start the preparations to bring Mordrak back. <laughs>